Welcome, one and all, to the mystical world of Felbar. Adventures abound throughout this realm, and we appreciate the opportunity to regale you with some stories from these trails. These accounts are all based on actual RPG experiences that occurred within Adventures in Felbar. Some of these tales may be for mature audiences, while others may be for very immature audiences. We now present the sage Mikas Tumo from Tamel, also known as the Bard of Felbar. Welcome to Session Fartuk-78. In our previous episode, the party learned how to use the coffer box item to store wealth. While they were skeptical, Geldor, Tyra, and Karina all had never heard of a problem while using it. The group hesitantly tested it with Welby's mysterious box and seemed to have success with it. The Grateful Miners turned over a sack containing 1,800 gold pieces worth of gemstones to the party from the tomb pillaging. We rejoin the party as the Miners leave with a promise to buy them all a round of drinks tonight at the Feathered Pig Tavern where a Miner celebration will be taking place for all of the Miners. The group told Geldor and Tyra that they would be happy to attend the festivities and would seek them out. Once the pair left, the group eyed the strange magical device and obviously had lingering doubts over the safety of the item. Karina shared her opinion that it was widely used by rich folks in Phoenix, but was actually thrilled to see one in person. The group then peppered her with questions, but her scant knowledge of the inner workings of the device still left some of those queries unanswered. A vote was taken with a result of 5-1, to one, with Bulger being the lone standout. Sister Elaine pointed out that each of them was entitled to 300 gold pieces worth of stones and, if he wanted, could keep their share. Bulger pondered the offer but conceded that if the others were going to trust the magic box then he would join them. We've been in this together long enough. I trust your opinions. I would like to keep some spending money though just in case there is anything interesting to purchase or consume in this town. The others nodded their head in agreement and decided that each would put the valuables in but take out 300 gold pieces in coins, 50 for each, as spending money. Karina's eyes glazed at the amount, shrieking, 50 for me? The others laughed at her naive outlook. All told, the group put in most of their gold and jewels except for 600 gold pieces, which they split. A few moments later, the coffer flashed and Karina pulled out a parchment. A shocked look crossed her face and she dropped the paper. Is it gone? Did we lose it all? demanded the angry former sailor. Cabe snatched up the paperwork and scanned it, giving a low whistle in appreciation. The others, anxious for an answer, looked nervously at the bard. Well? demanded Bolger. Cabe announced that they had not lost it and their endeavor had netted them over 3,400 gold pieces of wealth. Shocked, the group looked at each other in amazement not realizing how much they had been hauling around in the rough sacks. A group hug ensued and Bulger did a jig of happiness at the news. Karina was blown away and stunned at the number. I... I had no idea so much wealth existed. We're rich! With everyone overjoyed at the news, Sister Elaine went to work dividing up the 600 gold pieces which each member scooped up. As a point of order, said the cleric. This money does belong to all of us, but withdrawals should be made with the group knowledge. They all nodded their head in agreement and threw a hand into the middle, pledging on their word. Each member was told the secret combination, and they further agreed that, upon their demise, any of their cut would be given to their survivors. Both Bulger and Karina pointed out that they had no family, but instead felt that the group were their relatives, and their share should be divided amongst the survivors. With money in their pockets, the group exited the stone building and noticed the town was bustling in activity. Let's go find a place to stay first, stated Lady Irena. Walking their mounts, they moved through the main street that encircled the lake. After a few minutes of strange looks, most of which garnered by Peepers the Axe Beak, the party passed by the Feathered Pig where they observed Geldor and Tyra making arrangements for a private party. Several shops were passed with a textile dealer catching the eye of the bard, waif, and mage, as well as a weaponsmith shop for Fargus. Two streets down from the tavern, they located the Cross Swords Inn, which had a corral on the back side of it. Cave and Sister Elaine entered and spoke with the owner, who confirmed that they had a plethora of rooms available and could house the mounts, including peepers. 
The pair conferred and were told that the rooms were on the third floor, were large enough, and would easily support a trio of occupants. Sister Elaine advised that they would take two such rooms between the six of them, as caution was always a good thing. They opted for the back room so that they could keep an eye on the corral as well. Prepaying for a week, the group turned over a measly 20 gold pieces and went outside to report to the others. The group seemed satisfied by the conditions, agreeing that a single room could prove troublesome in an unknown locale. Moving to the back of the property, they found a young boy with a crippled leg. Eddie was initially scared of peepers, who eyed the boy with uncertainty. The young man quickly and expertly moved the horses into the corral and quickly removed the tack from the creatures. Upon his return, he was still uncertain about the axe beak and his fear was obvious. Karina told the others to go to their rooms without her and she would stay with Peepers and Eddie until he felt more at ease. As the others walked away, Peepers approached the young man and rubbed his head against the creature's beak, causing him to visibly soil himself. The waif chuckled but quickly apologized and told Eddie that it happened to everyone the first time. She felt a little white lie would help the boy, and then she told him to go get changed and she would settle her mouth. The boy looked crestfallen and pointed out that he didn't have a change of clothes. Karina felt horrible and was uncertain what to do. She asked if the boy was paid for his work and was told yes. Eddie explained that this was a mining community and the prices were quite high for a job as measly as his. Looking around to avoid beggars, Karina slipped the boy two gold pieces and put her finger to her lips for secrecy. Eddie was elated but could not find the words to thank the young woman. She leaned in and whispered that she knew what it was like to be poor and to use the money wisely. Peepers, noting the exchange, put its head on the boy's shoulder and cooed loudly. See, I knew you two would get along quickly. The boy gingerly petted Peepers who continued to coo loudly at the attention. With Eddie no longer concerned, Karina turned to leave and observed Commander Tressa and Norink watching the pair. Taken aback briefly, the wave smiled and nodded, which was returned by the guard leader. Uncrossing her arms, Tressa moved on between the buildings and sauntered away from the area. Karina returned inside and moved up to the third floor, finding the group who had left their doors open while they moved their stuff in. As before, the group split up, men and women, for the adjoining rooms. We close out this episode now and give you our thanks for listening. Please subscribe to this podcast, and don't forget to follow us on Twitter, at The Bards Podcast. For everyone in Adventures at Philbar, thanks for listening.